Hello everyone, my name is Kadim Al-Hayyam. I am a sixth year medical student at uh, USG, currently a an intern at uh, Hotel Jeu de France Hospital. And I am a LAMSA ambassador. This is my second year as a LAMSA ambassador. And today we're going to be talking about eating disorders. This is a topic that interests me and imports me a lot. Uh, before we start our, um, our talk, I'm going to introduce LAMSA. So LAMSA is the Lebanese Association of Medical Services for Addiction. It is an NGO founded by Dr. M. Karzil. It is based on evidence-based medicine to educate and, uh, and make awareness of addiction, mental health, and co-occurring physical health and well-being issues. It aims to destigmatize those diseases and to implement strategies to systematically screen individuals for addiction and behavior, eventually promoting for a sustainable and healthy community. So to introduce our topic of eating disorders, uh, if we open the DSM, the DSM and, it, and its fifth edition is the latest edition of it. It is the uh, book that is a reference for psych psychiatric illnesses. And if we want to read about uh, eating disorders, we found this definition. Persistent disturbance of eating or eating-related behavior that results in the altered consumption or absorption of food and that significantly impairs physical health or psychosocial functioning. So through the definition alone, we can see that eating disorders are a serious psychiatric disorder that is characterized by abnormal eating eating and weight controlled behavior. And all eating disorders really impair the physical health and of the patient and will really disrupt the, psych the psychosocial functioning of them. And this is why it is classified as a, a psychiatric disorder. This, these illnesses have a lot of comorbidities and especially psychiatric comorbidities reaching 70% of the patients. And the most uh, uh, the most dangerous comorbidity is suicide, but we can also cite mood and anxiety disorder, neurodevelopmental disorder, and even substance use disorders. And eating disorders in general are also linked to organic uh, illnesses such as diabetes and even autoimmune uh, diseases such as Crohn's disease or even uh, celiac disease. Now, we know that eating disorders uh, will change uh, varying by gender. In men, the body image concerns are mostly focused on muscles, while in women, they are mostly focused on weight loss. So this is the outline of our presentation today. I'm going to be tackling first the epidemiology of eating disorders, then their pathophysiology, or, or how they are, uh, between parentheses, created in the patient. Then we will be discussing some physical findings that we can see in eating disorders. And then I will be tackling the six main eating disorders to, uh, to finally tackle their treatment and their management. With respect to the epidemiology, we know that eating disorders affect individuals of all ages, gender, sexual orientations, ethnicities, and geographies, but we know that the population that's mainly at risk are adolescents and young adults. We know that anorexia nervosa starts the earliest out of the three. It has a very rare onset after, th after 30 years old. So in adults, it's, uh, it's another eating disorder that prevails. It's mostly binge eating disorder. If we look at incident rates in general, we know that it is stable for anorexia nervosa. It is stable, but mostly on decline for binge, uh, bulimia nervosa, and it is rising for binge eating disorder and other specified eating disorders. But in general, there is a 25% global increase of eating disorders, not only because they are most, more common in our society, but also because we are diagnosing them better and there is less stigma around them, which uh, which makes patients uh, not scared of uh, of reaching out for help. If we look at the population at a given time, we know that there is 1% of anorexia nervosa, 2% of uh, bulimia nervosa, and 2% of binge eating disorder, which makes a general of 5% at any given time. And we know that in general, but especially in anorexia nervosa, eating disorders are, are an illness that prevails mostly in females, with a female to male ratio of 10 to 1. And we know that of, out of all of the patients, only 20% will reach for treatment. So what is the pathophysiology of eating disorders? Honestly, the concept of eating disorders is still uncertain. Is it a problem of eating, of body image? Or is it neurotic, psychotic, or even psychosomatic? So there are many theories and many factors that go into eating disorders. So I will be tackling some of them and to start with the genetic uh, theories. The strongest genetic evidence is actually for anorexia nervosa because lately there has been the identification of eight regions on chromosomes that are associated with anorexia nervosa. And we know that there is a positive polygenic correlation with many brain-related behaviors. So these chromosomes that, uh, uh, that could be linked to anorexia nervosa are also linked to other psychiatric disorders, especially OCD, and even personality traits such as neuroticism. 
Now, depending on the study, there could be negative but also positive correl genetic correlation with what we call the metabolic syndrome. It is a syndrome that uh, that tackles a uh, a higher BMI, insulin sensitivity, cholesterol level, hypertension. So, in general, we could say that anorexia nervosa has has a very uh, genetic correlation with psychiatric and metabolic traits. Uh, so we are looking at it a bit differently because it has so much genetic factors that go into it. If we look at longitudinal studies that have been made over the year, the years, we can see that picky eating and leanness are mostly associated with anorexia nervosa, while a more uh, healthy appetite and people who are a bit more overweight align more with binge spectrum disorder. But there is a difference. It doesn't mean that picky eaters will develop anorexia nervosa. It's just a positive correlation that has been found by some studies. Also, if you look at the environmental influences in the perinatal period, uh, if these environmental uh, influences happen in that perinatal period, the uh, uh, the child that it's, that it, that's in the womb is more at risk of developing anorexia nervosa. However, if these negative influ uh, environmental influences happen in the early childhood, they are more at risk of developing binge spectrum disorders. Even some factors are temperament traits. So we know that there's um, that eating disorders are associated with anomalies in neurocognitive functions. Uh, uh, most patients with eating disorders have a very low self-esteem. In anorexia nervosa, we also see problems in social cognition, anxiety, anhedonia, insecure attachments. So that kind of reminds us to autism spectrum disorder and even anxiety traits and even um, obsessive compulsive traits. Now, in all eating disorder, there is a uh, a lack in the inhibition disinhibition behavioral spectrum. That means that their disinhibition and inhibition towards food is uh, is is not perfectly healthy, and it's get and these patients can lack in that uh, in that manner. We can also see biological implications in eating disorders. For example, there is what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. It is an axis that goes from the brain down to the adrenal glands near the kidneys, and this axis uh, mostly regulates hormones in our body. Now, this axis in general is activated when humans are put in very stressful situations. We know that people with eating disorders, and especially anorexia nervosa, in these patients, this axis is always hyperactivated. And if there is a, a negative feedback that should be applied on it, in these patients, it is altered and it is lowered. Even there are two regions in the brain that are, that are called the insula and the amygdala. These are two areas of the brain that are involved with perception of the body image and negative emotions. In anorexia nervosa especially, but also in eating disorders, the responses of these two, uh, of these two regions are perturbed. I mentioned beforehand the imbalance in the inhibition disinhibition uh, spectrum, but also we know that there is a lot of impulsivity association in eating disorders, and especially in bulimic spectrum disorders, which really reminds us of ADHD, where people have a lack uh, a lack of controlling their impulses. And in eating disorders, the reward learning is impaired. We know that the reward system in our brain is um, is a neurological system that's mainly uh, that, that's mainly based on the neurotransmitter dopamine. So. We have noticed that in patients with anorexia nervosa, they show a delay in the reward response, and people with binge eating disorder show a very fast response to it, and even people with binge eating disorder show an increased intention and approach to food cues. If you want to summarize every, everything that I just said, I just uh, I just said a lot of information and a lot of factors, so that shows us that there is a lot of interactions between genetic and environmental factors and there is a crucial there are crucial developmental periods in the patient's life there are predisposing factors that are background vulnerabilities then precipitating factors of the disease that are mainly environmental context at the time of the onset to finally have perpetuating factors that are the secondary aspects of the illness that cause the illness to be valued and then maintained here i'm showing you um and the interesting tables that I found that uh, kind of resume the etiologies of uh, on the left restrictive type eating disorders and on the right bulimic spectrum eating disorders. And as you can see, there are so many factors that get into it that are here divided into four uh, categories, biological, psychological, psychosocial and behavioral factors. And in each factors, there are so many subtypes of them, uh, as you can see. So that's just to tell us that eating disorders are not caused by one factor. It is an agglomeration of many factors that get uh, with each other. In each, patient, in each patient with eating disorders, there are a lot of physical findings that we can find and consequences of that eating disorder. So to start with anorexia nervosa, we know that all of the, system, the systems of the body are affected by the starvation and that the damage accumulates over time. 
mainly the physical findings are caused uh, because of the purging behaviors. I will explain the meaning of purging behaviors later on during the presentation. And we can help with cardiovascular uh, consequences of the eating disorders, mainly hypo hypotension and problems in the uh, cardiac rhythm. rhythm. There are also dermatological consequences of uh, anorexia nervosa. The skin become, becomes very scaly and dry. Um, there could even be hair loss and what we call the nugo, which is a fine body hair that gets all over the body. There are also endocrine and metabolic uh, problems. And these problems are mainly because of the uh, purging behaviors, such as hypokalemia, uh, which is a lowered uh, serum dosage of potassium. And that could also lead to uh, problems in the heart rhythm, as we can see on EKG readings here. There are also gastrointestinal problems, hematologic problems, such as anemia, neurological, skeletal, such as osteopenia, which is when the bone uh, density and the bone structure is altered, etc. And mainly also reproductive consequences consequences such as amenorrhea, amenorrhea and infertility problems. In bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorders, the physical findings are also due, uh, are however due to the effects of starvation and vomiting. In general, they're similar to anorexia nervosa, but less severe, but there are some specific factors uh, or problems related to the purging, mainly uh, cardiovascular uh, problems, such as uh, rhythm problems, endocrine and metabolic problems, gastrointestinal one, we can see constipation, we can see ulcers here, I'm showing you an ulcer in the esophagus, and even gastric erosions and perforations. We can also see hematological problems, oral problems, uh, like dental erosions. So mainly dental erosions are because of the vomiting that people with these illnesses have uh, or induce. And we know that the vomit is very acidic, so it will erode the, uh, the, the teeth of the patient. Now I'm going to be tackling eating disorders per se. And we know that the, in the DSM-5 and the ICD-11, there are six main eating disorders and there are three main ones and three other ones that I will be tackling today because I really find that uh, the three last ones are not really well known and are not usually tackled in such talks and articles. So first I'm going to be talking about anorexia nervosa. Anorexia nervosa is the eating disorder that's the most common in, uh, or that everyone kind of thinks of when we talk, when we think about eating disorders in general culture. It is a highly distinctive and serious ment mental disorder. This mental disorder is characterized by an intense fear of weight gain or, and or a disturbed body image. And this will lead to severe dietary restriction and other weight loss behaviors. The idea of intense fear of weight gain and disturbed body image is what differentiates this illness from another one that's called avoided restrictive food intake disorder that I will be talking about later, but just keep that in mind. Now, for each eating disorder, I will be mentioning the DSM definition of it uh, that are the diagnostic criteria that we use. So first of all, there are three essential features of anorexia nervosa. Uh, first, persistent energy intake restriction. Second, intense fear of gaining weight or becoming fat or persistent behaviors that interfere with weight gain. And third, a disturbance in the self-perceived weight or image. So usually the individual will maintain a body weight that's below uh, minimally normal for the age and the sex and the, the, and the developmental trajectory of the person. And here we mentioned developmental trajectory because in children and adolescents, it's a bit hard to define underweight because of their uh, growth. So the way we can uh, uh, we can detect anorexia nervosa is through a uh, uh, is through differences in the developmental trajectory trajectory, meaning they don't usually reach the goal that's required of them uh, for their height and their age. Uh, patients with this disorder will usually display an intense fear of gaining weight and becoming fat, and this fear is not usually alleviated by the weight loss, and in fact, it becomes like a vicious circle. This concert with weight gain might even increase as the weight falls. And younger individuals with uh, anorexia nervosa and some adults usually do not recognize or acknowledge their illness, so they will not usually seek help by themselves. If we look at the definition, there are two subtypes of anorexia nervosa. There's the restricting type, where the patient will limit their food intake, but also the binge eating purging type. In that subtype, there are purging attitudes, such as induced vomiting, but even laxative, that are substances that induce diarrhea, strenuous, strenuous physical efforts, uh, weight loss medication, or even stimulants like amphetamines and other medications. So... Uh, with that definition in mind, we know that in anorexia, nervosa, in anorexia nervosa, the individual's weight must usually be significantly low. But because of differences in age and gender and ethnicities, etc., it is a bit hard to define a non-underweight um, person. So this is why we usually use what's called the BMI. In international standards, a BMI that's lower than 18.5 uh, 
defines an underweight person. So we can see that in the definition of anorexia nervosa, uh, the severity of it is uh, divided by the BMI uh, in mild, moderate, severe, and extreme cases, as you can see in the uh, lower uh, case of the definition. And uh, finally, we know that in that uh, disease, the uh, patients have a cognitive and emotional functioning that's markedly disturbed. How is the diagnosis made? It is uh, firstly important to note that all eating disorders have a clinical diagnosis, meaning that we rely on the criteria of the DSM to put the diagnosis. There are no really physical and imaging or biological exams that need to be made. But uh, as I mentioned beforehand, it is rare for an individual with anorexia nervosa to complain of the weight loss per se, and they usually cannot acknowledge the fact that they have a disease. So this is why, first of all, it is important to talk to the family, and most of the times the individual is brought to a professional by a family member that, uh, that raised concern because they noticed a uh, marked weight loss in the patient and if the patient themselves uh, will um, seek for help it is usually because of a distress over the somatic and psychological consequences of the starvation there are a lot of complications as i mentioned to anorexia nervosa and we saw the physical findings uh, a bit beforehand but the main risk is suicide it is actually a crucial complication of anorexia nervosa, and it is one of the main reasons of mortality in that disease. It is very elevated, like, as we can see, 12 per 100,000 suicides per year. So this is why every time we put a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa, it is very important to evaluate the suicide risk. We should evaluate the uh, suicide ideations, suicide, uh, suicidal behaviors, and risk factors of suicide, which are mainly past attempts. The diagnosis of anorexia nervosa could be a bit difficult if there are other psychiatric illnesses that accompany the uh, the patient. Usually in depression, people feel like they are undeserving of food, so they will not eat, and they also have a loss of appetite. And in patients with schizophrenia, schizophrenia is a uh, is a psychiatric disorder where uh, that is defined by what we call delusions. A delusion is when a patient has an idea that is we know that is wrong, but they are completely convinced that this idea is true. And in that case, a patient with schizophrenia could have a delusion of being poisoned. So they are 100% convinced that someone is poisoning their food and they will not eat. There are also a differential diagnosis that should be made. Uh, mainly, um, we should always rule out uh, organic uh, diagnoses, such as irritable bowel disease, uh, cancer and malignancies such as cerebral tumors uh, that could lower the appetite and uh, a marked uh, weight loss thyrotoxicosis, and even diabetes. We saw the physical uh, signs and symptoms of anorexia nervosa a bit beforehand. So what are the investigations that should be made? As I said, the, uh, the diagnosis is made clinically, but there are some investigations that should be made to evaluate the severity of the, uh, of the physical consequences of anorexia. For example, on a complete blood count, we can find leukopenia, which is a lowered... Uh, number of uh, white blood cells in the blood that could uh, uh, make the patient a potential for uh, repetitive infections. Then we can also see low blood glucose, uh, elevated liver enzymes and cholesterol, mild hypothyroidism, uh, heart problems, as I mentioned before, that could be seen on EKGs, and uh, even a lowered, uh, uh, lowered uh, serum dosages of uh, sex hormones such as estrogen and testosterone. The second eating disorder we're going to be tackling is bulimia nervosa. Bulimia nervosa could occur at normal or, ele or elevated weight, uh, which, which is what differentiates us from anorexia nervosa. And it is characterized by recurrent episodes of binge eating, uh, mainly. So what are binge eating episodes? A, a binge eating episode in, is, when a, uh, is when a person will eat an abnormally large uh, amount of food in a very short amount of time, usually around two hours. And during that episode, they will feel a complete uh, lack, uh, sense of lack of control, as if they cannot stop eating. Uh, after that binge eating period, there will be what we call inappropriate compensatory behaviors to prevent the weight gain. Uh, the most uh, common one is vomiting, uh, because it, it gives to the patient immediate relief. And during uh, uh, the uh, during the development of the disease, the vomiting could even become the goal itself. Uh, other um, uh, comp uh, inappropriate compensatory behaviors could include uh, laxatives, diuretics, medications, and excessive exercise, and it is considered excessive when it interferes significantly with activities of the daily life. And in that disease, the, there is emphasis on body shape and weight, uh, but we should uh, mention that the importance of the context is important. For example, if there are... Um, holidays, if there are special occasions, someone could eat a very large amount of, uh, of food in a very short period of time, but that does not make them bulimic. 
And uh, as you can see, it should uh, happen many times over uh, three months for at least a week. Uh, I'm talking here about the binge eating and the inappropriate compensatory behaviors. And in that case, the severity of it is not through weight, is not defined by weight, but rather by the uh, frequency of the inappropriate compensatory behaviors. The prevalence of bulimia nervosa is around 1 to 1.5%, with a point prevalence in young adults. It usually starts in adolescence, in adolescence because of precipitating factors, usually a very severe diet or a stressful life situation. And as in any uh, eating disorders, there are prognostic and risk factors that are mainly temperamental, environmental, and genetic. Uh, I'm going to be mentioning, for example, environmental factors that has been, there has been a lot of studies that have shown that uh, physical or sexual abuse during childhood would put the person at risk of developing bulimia nervosa. Differential diagnosis of bulimia nervosa could be uh, anorexia nervosa, uh, anorexia nervosa uh, with, the subtype, with the subtype of binge eating and purging, but in that case, these behaviors usually occur in the episodes of anorexia nervosa. So more frequently. And binge, uh, another differential diagnosis is binge eating disorder that I'm going to be tackling in a bit. Uh, but we should also rule out uh, organic uh, diseases and neurological conditions, especially such as the Klein-Levin syndrome. The syndrome is uh, actually a very rare syndrome that usually starts in childhood and it is characterized by uh, oversleeping, usually up to 20 hours per day, overeating, hyperphagia, which could lead uh, to... Um, uh, to uh, to clinicians thinking that it could be uh, bulimia nervosa and uh, usually behavioral changes usually on inhibited uh, sexual uh, behaviors and it usually uh, concerns uh, male adolescents. Uh, another psychiatric uh, disease that should be uh, ruled out is major depressive disorders with atypical features and in that case there is overeating but there are no inappropriate compensatory behaviors and no excessive concern with body shape and weight with uh, and weight which are um, primal conditions to diagnose bulimia nervosa. So as I said, binge eating disorder is a differential diagnosis of bulimia nervosa because it's very similar to it. So it's defined by uh, recurrent episodes of binge eating that I just uh, explained, uh, meaning uh, eating a lot of food in a very uh, limited time. But in that case, there are fewer or even no co uh, inappropriate compensatory behaviors. So the person eats a lot and will feel the lack of control. And during the binge eating disorder, they will have many feelings, such as eating much more rapidly than normal. They will feel uncomfortably full. They will feel a lot of guilt. They usually eat alone because they are embarrassed of that. But there are usually no compensatory behaviors uh, compared to anorexia nervosa. And here, the severity is uh, characterized by the number of uh, binge eating episodes per week. Uh, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, these two disorders, binge eating and bulimia, are uh, could be misdiagnosed with atypical depression where the person eats a lot but has no concern over their body uh, shape and image. And there are a lot of comorbidities of binge eating disorder. If you remember at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned ADHD and the problem with impulsive behaviors. So in 50% of patients, they are not diagnosed with ADHD, but they do display symptoms of ADHD. And 15% of uh, patients there are out of multiple comorbid impulsive behaviors, such as substance use disorder, impulsive buying, compulsive shopping, many sexual relationships, and even self-harm and intense emotions. And for people who are um, uh, who are familiar with uh, psychiatric illnesses and uh, terms, uh, this should really remind them of bipolar disorder, actually, uh, with the uh, idea of impulsivity, and that really reminds, of, uh, reminds us of the manic episodes of bipolar disorder, but also uh, borderline personality disorder and other personality disorders. The fourth eating disorder I'm going to be mentioning is what we call avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. So the core symptom of that is the core symptoms of that illness are food avoidance or restriction that will lead the patient to insufficient nutrition or weight gain with uh, one of these one or more of the following symptoms that are weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, uh, psychosocial impairment, and even dependence on some uh, nutritional supplements. So the, the, the to determine the significant uh, nutritional deficiency, that's uh, an important criteria of the uh, diagnosis factors, it should be it should be based on clinical assessments, uh, such as anorexia nervosa. And in severe cases, uh, particularly infants, the malnutrition can be life-threatening. So um, uh, to, to, to comprehend a bit more the symptoms, uh, it's as if the patient uh, the patient has uh, an absence of interest in food, and in some cases they are oversensitive to food, meaning the substance, the temperature, uh, the nature of the food, uh, etc. And it could even be sometimes a consequence of uh, negative of fearing ne of negative consequences of eating because of aversive past experiences like choking and vomiting. 
so that is what I just uh, mentioned. So for example, you can see the uh, vicious circle on the left corner. Um, uh, the, a patient could worry that the food could cause nausea, so they avoid, they, avoid, they avoid the food. In short term, there will be a diminished fear around nausea, so they will fear nausea after eating, and this is a vicious circle that, repeat, that will repeat over and over again. And on the right, as you can see, these are the same risk factors that are for all eating disorder, temperamental, environmental, and biological. And here I'm going to be mentioning the environmental factors. Uh, there has been a lot of studies that have shown that uh, mothers with eating disorders uh, are a risk factors of the uh, child themselves uh, that's raised in a familial anxiety uh, environment could uh, lead the child to develop uh, a and restrictive food intake disorder. The fifth eating disorder I'm going to be mentioning is PICA. So PICA involves eating non-nutritive or non-food substances on a persistent basis for a period of, of a month or more. And Basically, they eat what we call non-substance uh, food. So, what are non-substance food? I'm going to main a few uh, to name a few. Uh, the patient could eat paper, soap, cloth, hair string, wool, gum, metal, charcoal, ash, clay, starch, etc. Usually, um, the main triggers of pika are uh, a curiosity of the taste of the substance, either boredom or psychological tension. But the diagnosis of pika should be made above the age of two years old, because before that, uh, we consider that infants putting objects and what we call uh, non-food substances into their mouth is a normal part of what we call the uh, uh, mouthing, uh, mouthing period of their um, childhood. And usually no uh, biological abnormalities are found. However, there are many complications that could be found, mainly gastrointestinal complications, such as intestinal obstructions or perforations. And here I'm mentioning a clinical case that I found during my research for this presentation that I found very interesting. Uh, it is a clinical, um, sorry, it is a case report that has been made in Japan, if I'm not mistaken, that shows a patient with PICA that uh, ingested approximately 2,000 coins that led to uh, intestinal perforation. So their intestines were perforated because of the huge amount of non-substance food that they were eating, in that case, method. There are a lot of comorbidities of PICA. I'm going to cite some psychiatric ones, such as autism, schizophrenia, and what we call trichotillomania, which is a psychiatric illness of the uh, that is obsessive compulsive, actually. It is a compulsion of patients to um, um, to remove their own hair, actually. And physical disorders even should be ruled out, such as the klein levin syndrome that I mentioned beforehand. And differential diagnosis of PICA or anorexia nervosa, factitious disorder, which is another psychiatric uh, illness where the patient will fake their own symptoms for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, personal gains, and not suicidal self-injury behaviors and maladaptive behavior patterns. The last eating disorder I'm going to be mentioning is rumination disorder. Uh, this disorder involves regurgitation of food after eating it in absence of nausea for a period of at least a month. So more practically put, it is when a person will eat food and then without nausea, without involuntary retching, without disgust, without any other um, a problem, they will regurgitate their own food, meaning uh, get it up uh, again in their own mouth. They may chew it again they might uh, eject it, or they might even uh, swallow it again. Usually an infant, it's around three to 12 months of onset, and they put themselves in a position of straining and arching their back with their heads held back and sucking movements of the tongue. And they are very irritable and hungry between the episodes, and it could even lead to weight loss and uh, inappropriate gain weight. And even if the uh, regurgitation would follow every feeding, malnutrition may even occur. But usually in infants, the disease will uh, frequently remit alone. Uh, while in adolescents and adults, uh, they usually tend to hide their peak, uh, their uh, rumination disorder. And uh, they usually hide the regurgitation uh, periods by hiding themselves or their mouth with their hand or coughing. There are many differential diagnoses to um, rumination disorder. I'm just citing some psychogenic vomiting, bridge eating disorders, and other somatic disorders. So that leads us to the treatment and the management of eating disorders. The main idea of the treatment of any eating disorder is social importance. It's a crucial part of recovery, and the form of uh, that social support will vary with age, and mainly concerning the involvement of the family in adolescence. And it is a bit more modified with adults. I'm going to be tackling that in a bit. But um, I also want to uh, note that the importance of social media could be detrimental. For example, there are a lot of websites that are pro-anorexia. And as we can see, um, 
nowadays on social media, the image of a very, of very thin people is what uh, the um, um, is what the epitome of beauty is uh, currently is, and it is uh, it could be very detrimental for especially for adolescents with a predisposition or eating disorders that are diagnosed. So start with anorexia nervosa. In adolescent, uh, the uh, first line of treatment is family-based uh, therapies. So the family is uh, is included in the therapy itself. There are no preferences towards the therapy, but uh, there are other interventions also that could be made. I'm citing some, such as multifamily group therapy, so it's, uh, separated parental interventions, etc. Uh, there are factors that are associated with dropout of the treatment that are lower BMI, lower motivation, and binge, uh, the binge purge subtype, and factors that are associated with a poor outcome of the treatment that are graded eating disorder pathology and poor motivation. This is usually this usually happens in outpatient treatments, but in some cases, especially when the disease is very severe, it requires an inpatient treatment which is when the patient will go to the hospital for refeeding programs that are meal support, and even in some cases, nasogastral uh, tubes uh, feeding. There are, no actually there are actually no recommendations for uh, micronutrient uh, suppl uh, supplements. And we know that the most efficient treatment uh, or the treatment with the highest effic efficacy is a short uh, hospitalization, meaning inpatient treatment for refeeding and then family-based therapies. In adults, the therapy is different. It is not family-based. It is actually individually structured or structured on the individual. The therapy will reduce the symptoms, the distress, and the clinical impairment. And out of all of the patients, 25% will recover completely, but 25% do not uh, respond to the outpatient treatment. And even in 40% of patients, they require high-intensity care. And to reduce the relapses rates, uh, there should be an augmenting inpatient treatment by digital interventions that would encourage care supports. Now let's talk a bit about pharmacotherapy. And anorexia nervosa, the use of medications is not something that's usually done. And there has been a lot of studies, but none of them have shown a real uh, efficacy of any medication. So I'm citing one of the studies that I found that was my, made on uh, uh, on a medication called lenzepine, which is an antipsychotic in adult patients. In adult patients, it has shown a positive effect on weight gain, but no changes in the psychopathology of the illness. And compared to the placebo, it has shown no improvement on the withdrawal and the hospitalization rates. And there are even some recommendations um, to administer small doses of estrogen for girls with the chronic illness uh, that have a diminished bone age to mimic uh, pubertal estrogen. Uh, so this is actually when anorexia nervosa is very severe in uh, in female adolescents that ha uh, that really um, uh, has had negative consequences on their hormonal uh, uh, fluctuations, and this is to prevent osteoporosis. The treatment of bulimia nervosa is mainly family therapy as the first line of treatment, and usually it is a cognitive behavioral therapy that has shown the fastest improvement. However, with all of the progress that has been made, 60% of patients will still showcase core bulimic symptoms. In bulimia nervosa, we know that medication is actually eff efficient. Uh, so fluoxetine has shown negligible efficacy in promoting remission, but in general, SSRIs that are antidepressants have shown a lot of uh, promising results. And uh, we know that uh, a lot of medication have shown uh, positive results for weight loss, for reducing binges, and even effects on the psychopathology itself, such as antidepressants and mainly of the second generation, central nervous system stimulants, and anticonvulsants. In binge eating disorders, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is the most effective therapy, but other therapies include uh, structured self-help, acceptance therapy, the, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, and even mindfulness exercises. And concerning the medication, there is only one molecule that's FDA approved, and it's called uh, lisdexamphetamine. Uh, so in binge eating disorder, there are no really medicational, uh, sorry, medication for treatment. In all other eating disorders that are um, other specified feeding or eating disorders, avoidance restrictive food intake disorder, rumination disorder, and PICA, the way that they are treated is that we look at the pathology of the eating disorder, and then we will see uh, which one of the three main eating disorders it mostly resembles. And based on that, we will follow the same treatment as that main eating disorder. Uh, Family-based treatment have shown efficacy in treatment, and uh, for avoid restrictive food intake disorder specifically, there has been new variations of cognitive behavioral therapy that have been very efficient. And a lot of medications that have also shown a lot of benefits, such as uh, cyproheptadine, olanzapine, and mirtazapine. 
But nowadays, there are a lot of emerging treatments that are happening. And here I'm citing what we call neuromodulation. So neuromodulation is when uh, there is the insertion of electrodes deep inside the brain of the patient to target the pathology, the core pathology of the eating disorder, uh, because it's very biological here. So um, neuromodulation has shown early effects such as improvement in mood, weight, and the psychopathology kind of, but the later effects of neuromodulation are very promising because we, it has shown changes in weight and even in the disorder pathology itself. So to conclude our talk, uh, eating disorders are, a, are very uh, serious illnesses that should not be um, uh, looked upon uh, immediately, uh, that should not be uh, ignored in uh, clinical practices. And the three main ones are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorders. But there are also other ones that are rarely, un unfortunately, rarely mentioned in uh, uh, in a popular culture. Uh, it usually affects everyone, as you can see. It has many factors that get into it, uh, into its uh, development. Uh, there are a lot of treatments to it. As you can see, it's mainly therapies, but uh, also there is medication that's uh, that's being developed to it and even new treatments, such as I mentioned with the neuromodulation. But it is very important to always destigmatize these illnesses, to always help people with these illnesses, not to look at them and not to use offensive language, but rather help them try to make them acknowledge their illness. And um, because they are very frequent and these patients usually suffer a lot, and even though they cannot acknowledge their illness, they are craving for help. So this is the end of my presentation. Uh, these are the references that I use. As I mentioned, I use the GSM for the uh, clinical uh, 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 diagnostic criteria. And thank you so much for assisting.